we got a busy morning, but um, I'm going to make it busier. I'm going to ask Brendan McMillan if you'll start making your way up here. Um, while you're coming up here, we have a new class that's beginning next week. It's for the wives of anyone whose husbands are wanting to do the foolish thing of going to ministry. And so we want to encourage you women how to understand how to live, be one with a shepherd. And so my wife, Laura, is going to be teaching that class. It's going to be in the, probably this back classroom here for eight weeks uh, during Sunday school. So if you would like to attend that, uh, we would gladly invite any of the ladies to come for that. So my dear brother, would you like to join that class? Sure. <laughs> we got a lot to share. Um, I just wanted to bring this up. This Brendan has served here at this church as an elder and was so faithful, and um, me, he and I have grown a strong brotherhood. <laughs> um, and it, as I'm studying Philippians Epaphroditus, it says to hold people like him in honor in the body. And him and his family have gone out to Lake City and to Elizabeth in the pastorate to seek to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, and there, there's been some beautiful fruits, but there's, there's been some hard labors as well. So they are back here now at Southside, and they've come back to be healed up by this body and Lord willing to, if he's crazy enough, to send them out again. So, but more than anything, his family needs a landing spot to be loved and cared for and nurtured. And um, I've already asked them the million questions, just receive them and love them and let's, let's journey with this sweet family. So I, I ask you to join me in prayer for this special man. God, I thank you for BMAC. I thank you for the heart that you've given him for Jesus Christ. Heart that because of your grace will not quit and continues to seek your face, to know you and to love you and worship you. I pray for his sweet bride and his beautiful family. Lord, I ask that this would be a season of healing and blessing and blossoming and using their gifts again so beautifully in this body. Lord, we have so much joy to welcome them back in for this season. God, I pray it's for a day and that you return tonight. Mm -hmm. But we are so grateful uh, for this family and what they mean to our hearts. God, we give you praise, glory, and honor for them and the work of grace in them. Heal them, Jehovah Rapha. Amen. I love you. That's one of my heroes. Well, we have a great blessing this morning. We get to partake of the Lord's table together. It's one of the ordinances that God left to his church for our good and for our encouragement. And that's my prayer for each one of us this morning, that we corporately remember together that we are partakers of the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ, and we will end the service with that today. So what I would like to do is look at a passage that will help prepare our hearts to remember our precious Savior. And by the providence of God, we are in Philippians 1, 6. I cannot think of a better passage to get our hearts ready to remember Christ at the table. So I'm going to read where we left off last week, Philippians 1, 3 through 8. Paul says, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these words, for they are the words of God. They've been inspired by your Holy Spirit. What we hold in our hands this morning is therefore a perfect word from our Creator. There's no error. It's without defect. It is the mind of Christ that we will open up and look at. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate them to the minds and hearts of your hearers this morning. 
God, we desire that we continue our worship now in the word of God. Let every heart give praise to you that you began a good work and you're going to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. God, lift our praise, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, last week we began an overview of chapter one as we are studying through the book of Philippians. Uh, we've, the title for this chapter and this book is The Fellowship of the Gospel, just this glorious koinonia that we share together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we looked at this first point in verses three through eight, and Paul says we're to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another. So what binds us together and what is central in our fellowship is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us one and brings a unity that cannot be broken. And so our outline is Paul has given us three reasons then last week why he's so full of Eucharisteo, of thanksgiving for the Philippian church. And we saw the first one is that you are a participator with me in the gospel, the word koinonia. We, we have fellowship, we share, we're partakers together of grace from that first day that we were saved until now, 10 years later when Paul's penning this letter. Second reason that Paul gives thanks is because God is at work in you. He's changing you. He's conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, and we'll narrow in on that this morning. And in verses 7 through 8, he's thanking God because you are partakers of grace with me. We drink up the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I promise today that we would then delve, go back now and delve into verse 6, and verse 6 is just a diamond. Um, that the, You just look at it from every angle and it lusters. Uh, I pray that it would just shine in every heart this morning. I, I like the idea of a lozenger to just kind of let it uh, be in your mouth and suck on it and take in the flavors and the beauties of what is before us. So verse 6, one more time. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So let's take a look at it. I am confident of this very thing. The Greek word for confident is patho. And the tense of the, the verb here, according to Bag and A.T. Robertson, is that it expresses a present certainty or a conviction. You're, you're so certain of it, you, you would die on this. So Paul is beginning saying, I am convinced of this. He doesn't think there's a slight possibility of this happening. Maybe with a little luck, we can make this whole thing work out. But this is just so big to your Christian life. Paul says, I'm certain. I'm confident. He uses this in Romans 8. I'm convinced, same word, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I am so certain nothing can separate you from the love of God once it's placed upon you. He uses it again in 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am, here's our word, convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that last day. I am so certain that I can trust my salvation to him until that last day. And so Paul begins, I'm certain. In this world, there are not a lot of sure things. Most that have that title in my journey seem to always fail. I just think of uh, sports teams. You know, I thought the, the Nuggets would win last night and they just didn't. Uh, my investing... Um, relationships, all these things you think they're certain they're going to happen, and they don't. But this morning, I want to put your head down on a pillow that is a sure thing. You can die on this. You can give everything to this truth. It is, it's the surest thing in the universe. Salvation is by grace. And Paul's saying, I'm certain that it is going to be finished by grace, God's power. Romans 8, 28 let me flip over. It's been a while since we went through that. Paul says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, what's his purpose? For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That's the promise we're looking at this morning. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And when we studied that, they're all in the past tense completed action. So God has called you and justified you, and he says, you're glorified. As you sit here right now, it's as if it's certain that Paul can talk about it in the past tense, because God's going to do it. Nothing can pull you out of the chain of grace. Once you're in it, hell itself can't pull you out. I'm certain of this, Paul says. What a promise. This is why he's so confident, because it's promised by God. It's his doing. Praise be to God, it's not me, because I've had times when I thought it depended on me, and I would mess it up, and I would make a shipwreck, and I have no hope this morning if my certainty of getting to the end is based on my grip. (laughs) So we start things many times and don't finish because of strength, resources, abilities, circumstances, a change of purpose, or death. That cannot happen with God. And Hebrews 6 God says, I want you to be so certain of this that I'm going to make an oath. Two things. He says, God can't lie. And an oath. And an oath, you have to swear by something greater than you. So that's tricky for God. And he says, I swear by God that I'll keep this word and you'll make it to the end. I am so confident of this very thing. What are you so confident about, Paul? Paul? Well, he who began, this is an heiress that focuses the verb tense on the the inception, the start of it. Uh, He who started this work, he's going to the very beginning of the work, a good work in you. And, and, And so I love this word, he. That's why it's so certain. Who is he? It's God. And that's our hope and our certainty. I am convinced that he God, who began this good work in you, how did God begin a good work in you? Well, he called you into a relationship with himself, as we just heard in baptism. In Colossians 1, 22, Paul said this, For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. And to Jews, it's a stumbling block. And to Gentiles, it's moronic, it's foolish. But to those who are the called, the called ones of God, when this is preached, both Jews and Greeks, it's Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God to bring about salvation. Praise him. There's two kinds of calls in the Bible I want to talk about, in case you've never heard this before. The first call is the general call, and that happens every day where we stand and we proclaim the gospel and we tell all people, all nations, the gospel. It goes out. We're to call all men and women and children everywhere to repent and believe in Christ. And the question is, how do you repent of what you love? How do you come to what you hate the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to take this second call if anyone will ever respond to the first call. And this is called the effectual call. This is the one that Paul's talking about in our passage. This is the one that God creates in our hearts. It's a work of God. It's what the gospel calls for is you must repent and believe. And God does this work in your heart so that you most willfully and joyfully believe and repent and come to Jesus Christ with your own free will because he changes your heart and makes it willing. How did this whole thing begin? Do you remember when we looked in Acts 16 at how the church in Philippi began? And it said in verse 14, there was a certain woman named Lydia. Is she she here? Happy birthday. Her and I share a birthday and I get excited about it. How old are you now? Are you fair to say that? 24. That makes me old. (laughs) I, I I remember the day she was born. So a certain woman named Lydia, great name. From the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening to this general call. 
And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And then she brings the church into her house and it begins there. I've always loved the illustration of Lazarus. He's dead in a tomb and Jesus says, come forth. And you can't respond to that when you're dead. And I can preach the general call till the cows come home and call you to Jesus Christ, but you can't respond when you're dead. And when God gives life, you respond to the call, come forth. And you believe in Jesus and you come forth and you love and you treasure the Lord Jesus Christ. This is overwhelming. He who began a good work in you. God started this work. He gets all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. Ephesians 1, it says that that actually began before the foundation of the world when he set his love upon us. And then in the fullness of time, he sent forth his son to come and die on a cross in our place. And then at a specific time in your life, he called you. And all of a sudden, Jesus became lovely and a savior. And you believed in him and you came to him. And he saved you and he justified you and he made you right with God. James 1.18 in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, the call, so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. He began a good work. I pray you never get over that God began a good work in your heart this morning. Now bring that into our passage. Paul watched this. He watched this work begin in Philippi with the Philippian jailer and the, the prophetic woman who cast out the demon. And, and, and he saw that they had an instant heart for the gospel. And he's rejoicing because he knew that God would complete the work that he started in every believer. In John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. So he who began a good work is going to be faithful to complete it. You'll make it to heaven. You know why? Because of he, because of God, salvation belongs to our God. Charles Spurgeon said, if my finger were on the golden latch of paradise and my foot were on its jasper threshold, I should not take the last step so as to enter heaven unless the grace which brought me so far should enable me fully and fairly to complete my pilgrimage. He says, salvation is God's work, not man's. I want to draw out one more important part to my heart in this verse. So he who began a good work in you, and listen to what, what he's saying, he, he began it in you. This good work has begun in you. And I think that's important because I want you to see that this is not the work of the cross right here. It's the response to it. Christ came to this earth. He did the work of salvation. He accomplished it. He cried out on the cross, Tetelestai, which means it's finished. So the work of salvation is completely finished. The work is done. The sacrifice has been made once and for all. He sits down. No more sacrifices will ever be made again for the payment of sin. It's perfect and it's eternal. But this says he began a good work in you. This is God taking this gospel now into your heart. He begins the good work right inside of you. It's taken the work of Christ and he's applying it personally to every believer. It, it's a work that begins inside of you. So let's unpack this beautiful statement. In Philippians 1.29, it's to you it's been granted for Christ's sake. He'll say in just a few more verses, not only to believe in him, it's a gift to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. God has worked faith into us. The call has brought it to pass. I've said this a hundred times, regeneration precedes faith. 
God makes you alive and he gives you this gift of faith and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our believing, our faith, our receiving Jesus, our calling upon his name was God's work within you. And that's why I want you to hear this. Don't fight that. That's why your faith won't fail. If it's of you, it's gonna fail. Everything about me fails. And this is because it's of God, and he's saying, I gave it to you, and it will not die. It will not fail, because it's from God. And the faith that he puts within you, I'm going to perfect it. I'm going to grow it. I'm going to strengthen it. It just, it's, it's, it's like a thistle. I've tried to get those things out of my yard, and you just can't get rid of them. Faith will not go away, because it's from God. He'll purify it. He'll stick it in furnaces. He will grow this faith. And I'm going all the way back to years ago when I preached through 1 Peter. Listen to one of the most glorious passages of Scripture. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, salvation is mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Guys, that's the, what we're looking at right now in Philippians. And that gift is protected by the power of God. And there's an agency here through faith. So the way the power of God protects you from failing is by faith. And that faith that's given by God will not fail. And he says, you're going to make it to the end because he's going to, that, that, that faith is how God is keeping you protected. It's such a gift. Uh, and then listen to what he says. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, and we said that's necessary according to God, not you, you've been distressed by various trials. Why? that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, your faith is more precious than gold because it gives you eternal life, which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the same thing in Philippians 1, 6. So I want you to see that trials are the way God is perfecting and strengthening your faith so that you will not walk away and you will not fail. It's a gift to be put in the furnace. It's a hard one to amen, isn't it? But we need it. I want you to get this. The instrument that God uses to save you is faith. And he gives it to you. And it's not your own doing. It's a gift of God this faith was created by God by the effectual call. And this faith is where all good works will flow from. So he's going to grow your faith. He's going to mature it. He's going to show you areas of unbelief through different trials. He's going to show you idols that you've put your faith in. He began a good work in you. And I want you to hear this this morning. He will com complete it by growing and strengthening your faith by every high and stormy gale and every possible circumstance to make you into the image of Jesus Christ so that you will never let go of Jesus Christ and chuck him. You'll never let go. You will just keep growing in grace from one degree of glory to the next. And we're gonna look at that statement here in a second. But I just want you to get that he's going to say later, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who's at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So you're going to grow in being partakers of the gospel with me, Paul is saying. And it's so weird. Uh, I did, Lydia, we share a birthday. I had, Friday was my birthday too. Um, I've had a lot of them, more than 24. Um, but it's been almost 40 years since he called me and granted me the gift of faith. And I just stand here this morning with so much more clarity of the beauty of the gospel and my desire to spread it everywhere I can. I want Christ formed in you and everyone we can bring with us and let it begin with me. 
the reason I haven't checked this after so many sins and so many failures, I sit in faith and love for my Savior because of He. He who began a good work in me is finishing it as He promised and He took an oath to. To God be the glory that He began this in you the very first day and He's completing it in detail in every one of your lives this morning. And you want to hear the good news? He's going to finish the job. Do you see what he's completing the work in you? I hope you can look at your life and see how he's working. I get a front row seat to watch it in so many of your lives. And it's amazing to watch the handiwork of God. I never get tired of watching from every different angle of how he sanctifies. And he tinkers in all the right areas. You, you always say, why, why this area? This is my biggest struggle. That's why. He just knows where to tinker with his people. No matter where you're at, wherever you find yourself this morning, I want you to hear this. God is doing it not to destroy you, but to complete what he started in you. Praise be to God. And believe it or not, a rose-colored path will never complete it. Easy pastor, it's Brendan, will never complete it. So I praise God that he not only granted me faith, but to suffer for his name's sake so that the job will get done. And he'll do so until the day of Christ Jesus. On that day when Jesus comes back and he completes this, the job will be done. The whole curse will be removed far as the curse is found. And I'm amazed at the work that he began I'm amazed at the things that he's grown all of us in over the years. I'm discouraged with how much still needs to be completed in my own heart. But I'm amazed that he will finish this work completely. And one day I'm going to shine like the new day, noonday sun in righteousness and glory. You're going to be tempted to worship one another if you could see what you're going to be in glory right now. The, the perfection of this work is going to be so glorious. that The way the choir was singing, I felt like I entered into the throne room. Can you imagine when we're all there perfected? Just praising and singing, Jesus, Jesus give glory. Second Thessalonians describes this. For after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted. And to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, and he's going to come and he's going to deal out retribution to those who, who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed the gift of faith for our testimony to you was believed. And he's gonna finish this work that he began. It is absolutely certain the whole thing will get completed and we see in Revelation when he finishes this beautiful work. I just want you to hear this. That is why Paul is giving Eucharisteo. Euchariste oh. He's giving thanks to God because he's began this work in the Philippians. You're partakers of me in the gospel. You're partakers of grace with me. You've entered into the work that God has begun in your life and will finish. And, you're give, and you are given to helping me bring others into it and establishing the church in it. Southside, keep entering into the gospel together. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. One, lifting high the cross of Christ at any cost. Amen? Amen. So the reason I took a whole day on verse six is for the application. Any questions? One of the most beautiful doctrines in the Bible so I wanted to focus <coughs> on this foundation. The application is truly endless. And so I want to just make some applications and ask that you go to God and keep making these applications the rest of your days. First one, 
if we're sure that God will complete this work, should we do anything? Should we just stay in bed and, and just wait till he comes? Because he's going to finish the work. He's just promised it. And what, what we see in the scriptures is the fact that he's going to finish it, and it's certain, it actually strengthens and energizes you to do. This keeps you from giving up and quitting. He's going to finish it. There's some days I just want to give up because I'm failing so bad. And I look at this verse and it, it just lifts me every time. He's going to finish it. He's going to complete it. He's not going to just leave you and let you die and dry up and be dead. Romans 7 is so real to me, the battle against sin. Every morning I wake with the best intentions. I'm just going to kill it for Jesus. And every night asking forgiveness for all the failures. But this truth just strengthens and encourages me. Keep going because it's God who's at work in you and he's going to complete it. Don't stop. And I love in next week in verses 9 through 11, he says, God's going to finish this work. And then he bows his knee and prays, God, finish the work. If, if, it's, if you just sit in your pajamas, why is he praying that you might grow in righteousness and God do the work? Help him. Why does he say, one thing I do? Forgetting what lies behind, I press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I just keep laboring. I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. The rest of this book is what this certain promise causes you to do. It just enables you, it energizes you to not quit because God won't quit. So don't kick back and say, I do nothing. That makes me want to do everything because it's God who's doing it through me. It's causing me to will and to do his good pleasure. And so I'll flush that out through Philippians, but I wanted to throw it out as we begin. Second, what this promise has done for my encouragement and my discouragement. And I think mostly with just my failures, and I love Peter who blew it so bad. <laughs> and Christ comes in three times. When he comes back, he denied him three times. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? And he's coming and seeing, has he been humbled and has he been broken? And he has, and, and, and Peter would not submit to God. He fought everything he said. He got his sword out when it was time to die. When he said he was going to go to the cross, he shook Jesus, said, no way, that'll never happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You got your mind on man's thinking instead of God's. And Peter has just fought it. And now Jesus says, you, you're going to go to a cross. You're going to be led where you don't want to go. And you're going to go. And he goes, and he even says, I want to be crucified upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Savior was. Peter was fully submissive to Christ from that breaking. And now he says, you're going you're gonna to be the, the foundations, one of the foundation leaders as the church begins. And so I just want you to see that, that he'll, he'll use your failures, he'll use your weaknesses to keep shaping and using you for how he wants to advance his kingdom. So I want anyone who's just paralyzed with past failures, brokenness, sins. I just want you to look at this promise and rise up from the ashes and go forward. Forget what lies behind. And let's, let's go forward and what lies ahead. Thirdly, what this has done for my shepherding, and, and I'm just thinking through, you know, 11 babies coming in July, <laughs> um, parenting. God is at work in you. I'm thinking as a pastor, there are times when you can get discouraged. In the end days, there's five virgins whose lamps were not lit. They, they're not ready for the return of Christ. They're getting drowsy in the end days. And some of, some of you got some drowsy eyes. And you can preach to someone for 20 years about the beauty of Christ and our wonderful pursuit of him and the fulfillment of the law being love, and you just don't get it. You're a gnarly dude. And it's so clear that God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the work. You're going to make it to the end be, because of him. And you'll grow and you'll be sanctified because of him. And so you can, I, I personally, all the elders, I can give this flock to him and to him alone to do what only he can do. And so shepherds are, are called to just be faithful and not, not 
I'm going to make this happen. It's Christ who loves his bride. It's Christ who's at work. It's Christ who's going to finish the work in you. And so for parenting, again, Christ doing that work in your children. When you think you're the primary source of training your children, you're going to make idols out of them and choke them. And so um, I just just want you to get this where you can really trust God to do his work in others, in your children, your grandchildren, your flock, whatever it is, you can trust Christ that he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And we just want to be faithful instruments to God and his word. But man, what a freedom if you get that. I, I can look into a parent's eye and I can spot it. You're, you're so tense. Did, did I buy the right diapers? Should we be breastfeeding? Should we have done our delivery at home? You just, you, all day long, you're just sitting there like this. And I'm like, man, let Christ do what he does. There's a freedom that he wants to give to the saints of God. And I just quit biting your jaw, people. And let Christ finish the work that he began in you. Fourthly, I'm thinking of comparison God is at work in each one of us in a perfect way to perfect us. And there's a season when it might not look so good and a season when it looks really good and it isn't. Just let God work in you and grow your faith and mature you the perfect way that he's willed. And to, it's gonna look different in every saint in this body. And you don't have to compare yourself. That there's a freedom to let God work in you personally. And then I, I forgot to get it put up again, but do you remember that chart? If it's too late to pull that up, I'll be talking for a second. If it is, don't sweat it. Uh, I put up those charts of, of my goals on an earthly realm and then God's goals once he saves us. And as I've been looking at those and praying over those, um, I'm just seeing this verse right here. And when we pulled it up, it said, my goals are to have an ideal life. When I come in the world lost, I just want the ideal life. I want to live a happy life filled with pleasure. And I want to live a pain-free life from suffering. I want to be as secure and stress-free as possible. I want to have life under my control and on my terms. I want to have God, people, and circumstances cooperate with my goals. What's wrong with you guys? Get in, in line. And the fruit is that all of life now are just roadblocks. They're, they're, you just look that, here's my goals, and everybody, difficult people, painful circumstances, failed expectations, rejection, illness, and losses, they're just in the way of you getting your goals. And so God began a good work in you, and to complete it, I need to renew my mind to quit thinking man's thoughts about life and what I want. And I need to shift, renew your minds, and I need to start thinking God's goals now for my life. I've been born again to God's goals. And number one, it's to glorify him. There they are if you need to take a picture. Um, so God's goals, I, I live now for his glory. My life is no longer mine. I live, how do I glorify God? That drives every decision that we will make. How do I know him intimately? How do I grow in godliness? How do I serve an eternal purpose? to bear fruit and that it might remain, said Jesus in John 15. And now all these roadblocks there at the bottom of the picture become stepping stones. They're now God's stepping stones to do Philippians 1, 6. And he'll choose illnesses and difficulties and hard circumstances to grow your faith and to get you to think this kind of mindset towards life and eternal things. And so there's a good God who began a good work in you and he is working to complete you and to get you thinking eternally and away from this temporal mindset and just trying to comfort your own flesh and use God to come into your plans while you journey to glory. This is what God will do in your life. He began a good work and he's gonna complete it. And then my last one, maybe, maybe my last one. When struggling again, David Paulson, God bless him, he's now in glory. He wrote a book and he said the key to long haul sanctification, what we're looking at this morning. He said it, it's the direction 
It's the direction that we're going. It's not the distance that you've covered. It's not the speed. It's not how long. And I want you to hear this. It's, it's the direction of what he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete it. He's moving in that direction. And then he describes, you're going to have some seasons in your Christian life where you leap like gazelles. Anyone ever have one of those? Uh, when you first get saved, you usually can hear it in the testimony. The, the sky's bluer, the grass is greener, and you're just like, man, I wish I had that joy that they have. And so all of a sudden, when, when I first got saved, I no longer smoked, drank, or chew, went with girls who do overnight. And I'm just like, this Christian life is so easy. I'm just this little gazelle bouncing around, and I'm just growing like crazy. And then there's other seasons that come in, and it's a steadied, measured walk. He says you, you, you learn truth, you begin to face your fears, you serve other people, you build new disciplines of renewing your mind, you learn how to worship and pray and give your time and your money and your care for the kingdom of God, and you grow steadily. And it's, it's a beautiful season in the Christian life. And then he says you're going to have some seasons where you're trudging, and it's hard going. You limp. You don't seem to get very far, and maybe some old patterns start to creep back. But you trudge, trudge on in the right direction, reaching forward to what lies ahead. And then he says you're going to have some seasons where you crawl on your hands and your knees. Anyone on their hands and knees this morning? The progress is painful, and you're barely moving. But by God's grace, you, you're inching in the right direction. And then there's a season, he says, when you're not even moving, you're stuck. You're broken down, but you're still facing the right direction. He said, Psalm 88, you're like the psalmist, and you cry out, God, you're my only hope. Where are you? And so you don't sense his presence. You don't see him but you're still crying out to him. You're still looking. And then he says there's going to be times that you do a face plant in the muck, a swan dive. But grace comes and it picks you up and it washes you off and it turns you back in the right direction. He restores my soul, said the psalmist in Psalm 23. And so we're, we're going to have all these seasons in the journey of him perfecting what he began. We love the gazelle. We love steady and predictable growth. But there's no formula, no secret, no technique, no program, no schedule, and no truth that guarantees the speed, the distance, or the time frame. He said the battle is the direction. And he who began a good work in you will complete it. And we just keep our eyes on Jesus and we keep running to the author and perfecter of faith. And so whatever season you find yourself in, God's finishing the work that he completed. I was rejoicing with a brother this week in discipleship, and I, I, he was abused by his father, and I think he's in his 40s. He might be in his 30s, he could be in his 50s, but I'm going to say 40s to be safe. Um, and it's affected him deeply, deeply in his own marriage. And it's affected him in his parenting and how he views ministry. And in the last six months, I've just watched these shackles fall off with truth coming in instead of lies. And, and you, you could look and say, why God wait so long? And I can look at it and say, God's making a diamond for his kingdom. And so I don't, sometimes it'll take 20, 30 years of what, he's just so patient to build oak trees. And I just want you to, as you sit here, to just know there, there's a God who began a good work and he's gonna keep completing it. And he's gonna use every season in your life to chisel off what doesn't look like Christ and keep shaping and working. And so I pray that this promise will, will give life that no matter where you're at right now, God isn't gonna stop. He's gonna finish what he started. I'm gonna skip my last point. We need to go to the communion table. So I thank my God for you all that we share koinonia in the gospel, and that God is finishing the work that he began in your lives. As a shepherd, there's nothing more joyful to watch, and I'm just seeing him faithful 
to complete what he started. And every time someone hits that finish line, there's, there's a joy in my heart when they make it to the end in faith. And so I pray that we just keep being instruments of God to grow our faith, that it will not fail and we'll make it to the end and find the eternal reward forever. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a promise. What a verse. I pray that you'll use it to lift every heart, no matter where they find themselves in the, in the journey this morning. I pray Christ is the answer. Christ is the remedy. Lift their eyes again. Let them look at him. Encourage the weary this morning and the faint-hearted. God, let the gazelles come and encourage our hearts. God, let all of us in different places this morning be used to help lift our eyes to Jesus Christ. God, let the body be the body to one another. Lord, thank you for this amazing promise. Let it um, empower the saints of God. Let it be so sweet that it's not our grip on you that will bring us to the end, but your grip on us. Thank you that what you begin, you finish. God, how sweet it's going to be at the finish line. Lift hearts this morning by that great promise. Let it be as real as the fact that they're looking up here this morning. God, by your Holy Spirit, make it certain in the hearts of the redeemed. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray now, uh, bless our season and our time in remembrance together at the table. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So at this time, we're going to hand out the elements. This is just a reminder that this is for believers only. So if you have been given this gift of faith, um, let's remember together. If you're a visitor, we welcome you. If you have faith to celebrate with us the Lord's table. So let's all enjoy uh, looking and remembering again what Jesus Christ has done for us.
As we partake together, I wanted to read a poem that um, Paul Tripp wrote in that book that I asked you guys to get for Sunday mornings, and by the providence of God, it's a, a really good one for the communion table. <clears throat> he said, like a bad stain on white linen, like a black smudge on pure vellum, like wine spilt on a new dress, like paint drips on window glass, like mud on a new shoe, the stain won't just go away. It won't fade into nothing. You won't wake up one morning to discover that it suddenly disappeared. The deepest, darkest, most penetrating, stubborn stains must be cleansed. Denying that they're there will never work. Doing your best to hide them doesn't remove them. Living with them is foolishness. Hoping no one will notice is vain. Worrying about them changes nothing. Whatever has been stained must be cleansed to be new again. And so it is with the human heart. It is sad to admit, but no one has a pure, perfectly clean, unstained, pristinely beautiful heart. No one. Every heart of every person comes into the world stained by sin. Sin is immorality's permanent ink, sinking into the deepest regions of our thoughts, our desires, our motives, the purposes, the worship of the heart. This tragic sin stain is humanly unremovable. No matter what you attempt, no matter how many times you try, sin is there to stay. Without something that has the power to finally cleanse it, but you can look at your stains with hope because there's a cleansing stream and it flows through the righteous life, the substitutionary sacrifice, the victorious resurrection of Jesus. He came so that sin-stained hearts would have the hope of being clean again and new again and spotless in his sight again, one day completely pure again forever. If we confess that we are stained he is faithful and he is righteous and he will forgive our sins. He will cleanse our hearts and thoroughly wash us from all unrighteousness. Step out from the shame of your stains. Refuse to put your hope in things that do not cleanse. Walk away from a life of denial. Confess that you have no cleansing power of your own. Quit blaming your stains on other people and other things. Humbly bring the garment of your heart to him and put your stains in his hands, and he will wash you in his grace. He delights in doing so for you, what you could not do for yourself. He delights in making you clean. May we never stop gathering to remember, to grow in our understanding, and to deepen our celebration of the cleansing stream that is our Savior Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood, and the sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Shall we remember together, saints of God? Father, I pray that by your spirit, through the truth of Christ crucified, that we would realize that is the only way to deal with the stain of sin. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. God, let us remember now with joy the sacrifice of our Savior. Amen. Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus, amen? amen. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, take large strides. Return for your bride tonight. Lord, we are ready. We long for the the great marriage supper of the Lamb, the unending celebration of our eternal love for all of eternity. God, we, we look to it with faith and certainty. God, thank you for this. Thank you for this beautiful passage that we looked at this morning. 
God, I just feel so blessed to have your grace and that you finish everything that you start. God, thank you. Thank you for the way you use it so specifically and beautifully in each one of our lives. God, help us to submit to the hand of God in every area this morning. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.